Brandon Timchin at the Metal Meeple here, and in this video, we're taking a look at Zpocalypse 2 Defend the Burbs by Greenbrier Games. This was designed by Jeff Garcia, Zach Parks, and Julie Ahern, and it was illustrated by Stephen Gibson, uh, the same artist who did Grim Slingers for Greenbrier Games. It's a one to five player game, takes about two hours, and essentially each player controls a squad of survivors, and you're going through this day night cycle in order to build up your defenses in the day and try to survive through the night fighting zombies and such. There's a, a bunch of chapters in the scenario book that you play through and you get to take your guys from one game to the next until you you know do all the chapters and you beat it. So let me show you how the game's played and we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. So here's the typical setup for Zpocalypse 2. You have the daytime board up here, you have the nighttime board over here, which is where the combat happens, and we have one player's stuff right here. Now, to begin the game, you're going to select a scenario, or you're going to just begin from chapter one and move on. But the storybook, sorry, the uh, survival manual actually has a prologue mission that you can play that focuses on the night time, which is basically the combat. After that, it explains the rest of the rules, and then you move on to chapter one of the storybook, and you can take your characters with you, the survivors and all the gear that they've had, the perks they've gotten, and you can move on all the way to chapter four in which that's the end of the story. Now you can play most of these chapters uh, without having a save. It says here, starting this chapter without a save. It also has a character sheet in the back that you can keep track of all the players' items and, and gear and all that stuff that they had. And, but we're just gonna kind of explain a little bit of the game, not all the rules, just to give you an idea of how it works. Each time you play this game, it's going to go back and forth between day and night, and then day and night, and day and night, uh, until either two things happen. Either you fulfill the goal of the scenario, or this day tracker gets to 30, in which case most of the time you're going to lose. That's probably not going to happen as much. It's probably going to be that you lose because you all died. Anyway, over here on the, day, uh, the nighttime board, it's where you're going to move your miniatures around and fight zombies that spawn on these spots on the corners you have to protect this building here. So let's just zoom in and show you a typical nighttime action and, and how a player would go around their turn. <clears throat> so during your turn, the first thing you're gonna do, uh, by the way, on the, on the nighttime phase, you do play five rounds. And at the end of each round, after all players have went, the zombies will go. And then at the end of all five rounds, the, uh, the, daytime, or the nighttime phase is over, you remove all the zombies off the board and then move on to the daytime phase because the zombies do not stay out at day. So to start your turn, you're gonna take these Zpocalypse dice. They're essentially just six-sided dice, but they have a Z instead of a six. You're gonna roll two of these per survivor in your squad. So you can have up to four survivors. You can roll up to eight dice, but we're only gonna roll four right now. And I'm gonna put it like this just for now. You're gonna line these up in order. And then that's the, the dice you get to spend on the actions that you want to do. Most of the time you're either going to move and then attack, or you can do any number of moves, but you, can, you have to spend dice in order to move, and you can't move more spaces than the lowest speed value of your characters. So if you look at this character here, he actually has a speed of seven. The other character has a speed of eight. So you can spend dice up to seven pips and only move up to seven spots in, the, in your turn. So in this case, let's just say we were outside this building here. We want to move up so we can spend this three to move up two spaces. Diagonals are just one space. And you'll see on the board, as you move around, there might be arduous ter terrain, which is that little uh, triangle symbol. Let me zoom out. And if you move over the space, such as this, <clears throat> then it costs two to get over. And if you step on spaces like this, you actually have to gain one of these symbols, which is a biohazard, and you're going to assign it to a character. Sometimes you can take this radiation, um, or I'm sorry, the radiation is the other one, this is biohazard, whatever. But radiation will actually deal bleeding damage, essentially, uh, through the daytime phase. You don't really want these. These are, are bad too, but the, um, the, you can gain uh, certain perks with them as well, like mutations. There's other things on the board here, but just remember that diagonals do count as one space. Anyway, so if you wanted to move, you would spin a die, you just put it on your player board, and now you get to attack. In order to attack, each character is going to have, let's do this weapon here, 
Each character is going to have weapons. And in this case, you have an action point of five that you need to spend to fulfill this. You could spend a five and place it on this card to activate it. And this would do one damage. Sometimes they have special abilities down below. This tells you how the range of the weapon and what type of weapon it is. The type does matter because each character actually has skills down here. For instance, firearms, he can spend no dice on. So he can't even use firearm cards, so I don't know why he has the crossbow. Not bad. Anyway, you have the melee skill, in which case you have a two. Now what that says is you can spend up to two dice on your melee fighting. So what you can also do, if, if, <clears throat> if we had the weapon switched up here, and this kid had the crowbar, and we needed five, but we only rolled anything less than a five, we can spend multiple dice to equal that five, but you can't spend more than his survival s skill in that uh, so like the we weapon skill here, he can only spend two dice. So he could spend two threes or a three and a two or whatever, but he couldn't spend three twos to equal five or higher. You get what I'm saying. Anyway, weapons do have a ammo check. After you shoot a weapon, you have to roll this other six-sided dice, but the one is a click. If you roll that, then you have to exhaust the card and you have to find ammunition to reload it. Other stats on your character here. You have the health value, obviously. The smarts, if you look on the board, there are tiny little spots that will say, um, such as that one up there. Well, this if you can barely see it here. This one says, search armory. So if you're on this space, you can perform a search action. To do a search action, you spin a die, and you get to draw from whatever deck it says. In the armory's case, it's this one right here. As many cards as the highest smarts value on your character. Both of our smarts are one, so you're only going to get one. Otherwise, you would draw multiple and only pick one. This is cool. This is some short sports pads, kind of basically armor. They have different abilities. Sometimes abilities will have AP checks down here. Also, or not AP checks, but abilities that you can spend AP on. Uh, the characters also have, uh, such as this guy, he has ability checks as well. If you spend a three down here, you can activate this ability. Sometimes it'll say a Z. In order to, to activate those abilities, you have to roll a natural Z. You can't spend six points in other dice to do so. The rest of the stats are used in other things. Uh, we already talked about speed, and we already talked about defense. So when the zombie hits us, we'll minus our defense before we do hit points. But if we want to, we don't have to. But the other stats down here this is are used mostly in the daytime phase. Uh, during exploration or uh, scavenging missions and such. Once you're done with the turn, it's now the zombies' turn. They're pretty much going to move in a straight line towards uh, players and attack them. The first thing that happens is you roll 2d6 no matter how many zombies are around you. And if you roll a Z, you're actually going to suffer a critical wound from the critical wound deck. Otherwise, you're going to take damage based on what type it is. If it's a fresh zombie, they do 2. If it's a weak zombie, they do 1. And if they get damaged, they go from fresh to weak, from weak to dead, or undead, or undead again. Anyway, if you take a critical wound, you actually take the card first with, without looking at it, assign it to a character, and then flip it over. In this case, the character would receive two wounds, and they would also have minus one to those two stats, those skills. Other things you can do on your turn as you're walking around is you're trying to find scavenging, scavenging locations or search locations to draw from these resources decks because you're going to need these certain parts like wood and uh, there's a backpack that allows you to hold more stuff. Here's some uh, electronic components. You need these parts in order to build things with the scavenging and the crafting. Uh, you can also get food. You can search for food down here. And the food, you actually have to feed your people basically at the end of the daytime phase or they take the hit points. The daytime phase is basically this board up here. And each character has a token associated with them. So the yellow player here has one, two, three, and four. This would actually be the third survivor, the fourth survivor, but we're just going to use this token for now. You're going to use these tokens during the daytime phase to move, or sorry, to do different actions. So if I wanted to go scavenge, I would put a token here to represent that that specific survivor is scavenging. You can also go up here to craft and guard and, and rest. Once all players have put all their survivors on this board somewhere, you can see that rest, anybody can do that, but these are limited uh, until you craft. When you do the scavenging mission, you're actually going to look through the story booklet, and the story booklet's going to have a scavenging chart here. You can choose to go north, south, east, west, and then you roll a six-sided die. Say we roll a three, but we went north, so we went downtown suburbia. And we're going to actually find the firehouse. And then there's these skill checks that would happen 
and you have to, you know, basically the guys going on that mission are going to roll uh, dice and they have to equal or exceed these different skill checks or if they fail, they suffer the failure or they succeed, they suffer or they gain the succeed bonus, which in most cases is going to give you different resource cards, different food amounts. Uh, but either way, sometimes it's going to up the doom track. And that's something I mentioned earlier. The doom track over here, every player is going to have a meeple on it. As that meeple gains, or as your characters kill things and gain experience, they're going to go up on this track, and they can reach a milestone every five, or a perk stone, or whatever. Every five spaces, that's going to allow you to draw from this perk deck, and these perks will increase your skills, uh, such as your medicine or your, your uh, uh, mechanics and, and different things. You will also get training, which the training cards will give you special abilities. Sometimes you'll get mutations, which you have to spend those biohazard symbols uh, or radiation symbols to gain this card, otherwise you can't select it. That's going to allow you to basically level up your characters, essentially. Also on this board has the Doom Track, and as you do different things, the Doom Track moves up. During the night phase, you're going to spawn a number of zombies equal to the Doom Track. So if it's at 13, you're going to actually spawn 13 zombies around here. Sometimes, though, uh, for every time that you've passed a milestone, just like the perks, you're going to draw from these mutates. And these mutates are really powerful. They have tons of hit points. They do tons of damage and everything. Anyway, lastly, to finish up this board, you can also go crafting. The crafting has a deck of its own, and you have like basic crafting that you can do, and some of the scenarios will make you fix the truck. You have to have all this stuff to do so. The basic crafting allows you to put sandbags and junk walls out on the board to slow down the zombies. And you have other things that you can craft and you can even expand the port, uh, slots on the lookout tower and the uh, infirmary beds to expand the rest action. The last two actions here are just guard. These uh, lower the doom track by one. And then rest. Rest allows you to gain hit points back, but the problem is it also raises the doom track as well. So you can see how that can, if you had a bunch of people piled up down there, that would be a uh, pretty uh, devastating on the next daytime phase anyway that's pretty much the game i probably I, I didn't cover everything in it but you're going to go back and forth and back and forth until you succeed at whatever the objective is and then once that happens there is an mvp meaning that all your player cards and such oh, i forgot to mention that your players do have a daytime phase so they have special abilities during the daytime and then it has their um, little storyline on the back too they also have an obje objective that they can finish uh, to give you points at the end as well. So these victory points on those, the perks will give you victory points sometimes, the critical wounds will give you victory points because you're more BA with, uh, with damage apparently. Anyway, those don't actually give you more perks, but those give you victory points, and whoever has the highest victory points is the winner of that game, the MVP. So let's talk about what I think. And there you go, that's Zpocalypse 2. Hopefully that was enough rules to get you acquainted with the game without it playing it already. And uh, if you've played the first one, hopefully it's a lot similar. I haven't played it actually, so I don't really know. Although in the rule book, it does have a couple of rules that you can, or a couple pages that you can read through, and that gives you the uh, rules on what they've changed from the first to second game. Uh, so you can just read that. Plus there's a small scenario, a little battle that you can do if you have the components from the first one. So I thought that was nice as well. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that the day-night phase is awesome. I really like that concept. I like the fact that you get to build up your defenses in the daytime, and then at night you take uh, you get to go outside and fight everything and utilize all those things that you just crafted. Uh, the scavenging system is really fun. I really like that. There's enough in the book as far as the scavenging locations that even if you play through the chapters you know, at least one time, like play through the whole game. I don't, you know, you can't repeat the same ones anyway because you're supposed to mark them off, but there's plenty in there and you're not going to need to anyway, uh, other than just, you know, obviously because it's rolling dice, you might roll the same thing, but you usually you're going to have enough to go through. So thought that was pretty cool. And I really like this game with four players. I think a fifth player makes it a little bit harder uh, only because he's going to automatically bring plus one to the Doom track because most of the chapters will start off with a certain number plus the number of players. And on top of that, depending on uh, if you're playing from fresh or from a save, uh, you're going to bring two to four survivors with that player, and they're going to have to be assigned out on the daytime track. And most likely, some of them will go into the... Uh, the heal, which will increase the Doom Tract as well. So if you're not careful and you pick the, the farther out scavenging missions later on, then with that fifth player, you can get a third mutate 
on the first night cycle and it's terrible. It's incredibly difficult, uh, but that's part of the pressure luck of the scavenging, right? You need to maybe play it safe if you've got five players going on. Otherwise, it's not really that big of a deal. I'm just bringing that up because it happened to us multiple times. So with four players, amazing. If you have less than that, I would assume, you know, three is good too. I, never, I didn't try it with two, but you know, at the same time, I think that uh, the three and four players is probably the sweetest spot for being the best. Uh, the action system I actually was surprised by because I thought I wouldn't like it as much as I did. You know, because anytime you got a handful of dice and you roll them, certain people might get a little bit shafted by the dice rolls. You know, you might roll tons of low dice now and tons of high dice later. And that happens, but the cool thing is you get to add those dice together, uh, you know, and then uh, so you can pull off different abilities without necessarily always rolling fives and sixes and not being, or, you know, if you roll all threes and fours, you're not going to be able to pull off a five action point swing from one of your weapons. So you can combine two dice. You might do less actions than somebody else on their turn, but you still get to do most of what you want anyway. So I thought that was pretty cool. It, it was very surprising. And, uh, I just, I like to see fresh systems in place and I, yeah, I bet this was in number one, but at the same time, it's fresh to me. So I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I think that the game could have had a basic scenario in the booklet. There are only four chapters, excluding the prologue, which is pretty much just combat, and the mini fight, which is just for people with the first game. It could have had just a basic scenario, although you can play, I believe, three of them without having a save, but it just seems to me like it could have just been this basic, you know, survive as long as you can thing. That would have been pretty neat. Um, but I guess you could kind of make that up as, as well. You don't really have to have an objective and you just see how long you can last. But it does kind of degrade as you play because once you fight all five mutates in a game, you're not supposed to fight them again. So it would be cool to have a, a, a basic scenario, although there are expansions planned and obviously this will just grow and expand. And it's definitely a game that would uh, benefit from doing that. So. And anyway, the last thing I'm going to say is the artwork is amazing. It's really good. Steven Gibson pulls it off uh, in Grimslingers, and he pulls it off here. I think he's a really cool artist to, to look forward to in, in all his projects. So anyway, if you're a fan of Apocalypse or you like zombie survival games, this is a game you should check out because it, it is different than most zombie games out there, or at least it's got enough differences going on to where you can justify trying it out at least. You might be sick of the zombie stuff, but it is a survival game and it's pretty cool for that. So if you got any questions, feel free to email me at timjanette at gmail.com or follow me on the social media below. I also have a podcast called Meeple Core. Feel free to Google that. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. For watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.